Thank you, Christophe, for the wonderful music as usual. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bea Spadaccini, and I manage the Internews Health Journalism Network. Welcome to all our guests today. Just waiting for a few folks to um, join us. Um, thank you from wherever you are joining us around the world. Um, so I just want to say a few words. Um, today's webinar is dedicated to the power of storytelling for health and social justice through film. Um, before I introduce you to today's facilitator, I want to say a few words about the Internews Health Journalism Network, which was formally launched in October 2020 at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Internews Health Journalism Network aims to build a global and dynamic community of health media professionals Include, that includes journalists, health communicators, investigative reporters, media entrepreneurs, digital health innovators, and filmmakers. The network is designed to offer learning and training opportunities, online courses, and also hopefully in the future, some grants for health reporting and information-centered innovations with a specific focus to uh, reach marginalized and vulnerable populations around the world. As a community, we encourage peer support and knowledge exchange between professionals who share similar challenges and strategies when reporting on health and meeting the health information needs of their target audiences. I'm pleased to say that as of today, barely seven months into this program, we have about 740 registered members from 60 countries. Um, I hope you can hear me, and if you are not speaking, perhaps you can mute your microphone. Thank you. Um, we also have a handful of regional AJN ambassadors who are committed to nurturing their own health reporting networks in their own countries and region, manage WhatsApp groups, and repurpose existing internews health reporting resources. Um, folks, if you're not speaking, perhaps if you can mute your microphone, that would be great. Thank you so much. So let me um, just say a few words about um, our today's facilitator is Gita Saedi Kieli. She's the director of Film Aid. She will facilitate today's online webinar. Gita has worked in the documentary film industry for over 20 years as a film producer, editor, film festival director and nonprofit leader. She has spent decades producing social justice films and has led the thematic programming, thematic programming around indigenous storytelling, youth and environmental justice. So without further ado, over to you, Gita. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Bea. It's so nice to be with all of you today. Um, so uh, we are focusing today on how to harness the power of film to promote health topics. Often our greatest public health concerns are riddled with misinformation and lack of awareness, and film can play a particular role in solving these issues. We're going to hear from three partners that exemplify the power of film across the globe. And at the end of our time, we should have about 10 to 15 minutes for a discussion. So please share your questions with us um, in the chat throughout the, the hour or um, at the end. Uh, also, I just want to mention that this is a partnership with um, IHJN, the Knowledge Center, and Film Aid. Um, I have only been at Film Aid for a few weeks, so I'm, I'm brand new to this ecosystem, but I have been making documentary films um, for a few decades. I thought I would start um, my introduction with a quote that was shared with me yesterday that I really resonated with our conversation today. This is a quote from Dia Khan. She is a Muslim American filmmaker. What film and stories do is give us a, a tiny crack where we can re each recognize our own humanity in someone else. In that space, we um, in that space, we understand each other. And when we understand each other, we care. And once you do that, something better becomes possible. Um, Christoph, I don't think I see my slides. I wonder if everybody else sees the slides. No? Sorry, Gita. Christoph, can you put the slides? Thank you. I see it now. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes Great. it takes a few seconds. You see them? Oh, actually, I don't see it. No, I saw Christoph for a moment, and now I see everybody <laughs> else. Is that the same with everyone? Yeah, I don't see the slides either, the slide deck. Oh, oh there, there we go. There it is. Yay. OK, so I'm just going to share really quickly a little bit of, of my backstory um, to jump into film and impact. Um, I grew up in Chicago in the United States to immigrant parents from Iran and um, very young in life, it became clear to me that my reality was not represented in the media around me. Um, this got me interested in telling stories. So I spent many years producing films about the immigrant experience in the US. Um, most notably, I produced a multi-part series for American public television called The New Americans. Um, the series followed five immigrant families from across the globe over the course of many years um, acclimating to their new lives in America. We followed Ogonis living in a refugee camp in Benin. We followed a meat packer from Mexico bringing his family to join him in Kansas. We followed a Palestinian bride from the West Bank to Chicago. Two Dominican baseball players aspiring to the major leagues in Montana and an Indian computer programmer on an H-1B visa to Silicon Valley. Um, and as the filmmakers, our, our main objective was to paint a picture of these individuals um, without the label of immigrant immediately. We wanted to get to know them in their home countries, um, really see them in the cultures that they were brought up in, in the language that they spoke fluently, understand what motivated them to come to the US. Maybe it was opportunity, but often it was just out of need. And then come to the United States and see America through their eyes and through their experiences. Um, making this film not only inspired me as a filmmaker, but it engaged me as a change maker. The reaction of the film was immense. We built community screenings across the country that sparked necessary conversations. 
We worked with local governments on refugee and immigrant support services. We built a class curriculum used in K through 12 schools, and we even built a small foundation to offer financial support to the subjects of the film that needed it most. Um, it was after this film that I realized the magnitude and opportunity stories pose when they are heard by many. So um, I'm so excited to join Film Aid. As I mentioned, I'm very new here, but I, I just want to tell you a little bit about Film Aid. And um, we're really just hoping to work more and more with internews partners across the globe. Film Aid is a sub brand of internews. In the communities that internews supports, Film Aid aims to amplify stories through the power of film. FilmAid began 20 years ago as a way to inspire and build hope in refugee settlements, but it has evolved into a filmmaker training program and network opportunity. Today, with our community partners, uh, we can design and implement film projects and programs on critical health, rights, and environmental issues. The goals of FilmAid are to create multimedia content to inform, educate, and inspire. Amplify and empower voices we haven't heard from enough in our global society. To use the power and influence of film and media to combat critical social issues. To use a strategic and integrated approach to distributing our work, including broadcast, mobile cinema, workshops, community-based screenings, and digital media to work with communities to build necessary dialogue and drive social change. And um, to date, much of our work has been in the Dadaab and Kakuma refugee camps in Kenya with a population of more than 400,000. Um, but we're also working with Cambodian teens in Kyrgyzstan, in Zimbabwe, and starting a project with the Wayu community in Colombia. Internews acquired FilmAid because it understood film projects offer something beyond what public information and journalism can. By telling narrative stories that reflect real life issues affecting a community, a film can connect on a visceral level. It can be a vehicle for building empathy and raising awareness, and often the engagement of a good film can activate change that a community is in dire need of. This, of course, is the dream of every film project. Um, some projects gain more attention than others and have greater impact. Uh, but the art of filmmaking and empowering a community to tell its own story is also deeply effective. So for FilmAid and the people it works with, the journey is as important as the destination. We work under the notion that telling the story and sharing the story is how we change the story. Um, next slide, please. Christophe, thank you. Um, so I share this FilmAid illustration showing our theory of change as an example of steps we aim to take in making and sharing projects for social impact. Our theory of change is based on the integration of access, creativity, and participation, which drive individual and community change, contributing to positive social impact. Underpinning this approach is collaboration. Working together is fundamental to achieving change. FilmAid partners with communities, creators, NGOs, governments, and the private sector to ensure a collaborative approach. Film projects are often a labor of love, and filmmakers choose subjects and stories they think are important to share in order to right a wrong or inform a community. Along the way, a filmmaking team will work with partners and individuals who also care deeply about that subject. From this community building experience, many projects have robust impact campaigns. An, in, an impact campaign is the work that happens around the sharing of a film, often with social change and policy goals in mind. Um, no two impact campaigns are alike. Every individual film builds its own community and engagement structure, has its own methods of evaluation and goals in mind, and really has its own singular effect. Um, this makes the work laborious at times, but definitely more effective to create the change you seek. Um, 
So next slide, please, Christoph. Uh, so I am asking all of you uh, to get in touch with me if you want to learn more about FilmAid or um, if you think that there might be a program that we can or a project that we can build together. We do have some funding in place for pilot camps to take place in the next year. So if you think uh, we might be a fit, I would love to investigate that with you. Today, we are going to hear from three of our partners on the work they are doing across the globe. Um, we're going to be hearing from STEPS in South Africa, Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation, and Black Girls Film from Chicago. Uh, I'm going to open up and introduce STEPS, and I'm going to let them take over for about, uh, everybody's going to have about a 10 minute presentation. And as I mentioned at the end, um, we are going to uh, have time for a Q&A. So we have uh, Teresa, Teresa Hill and Elaine Manet with us. Uh, Steps, or Ter Teresa is a project manager with Steps. She has worked in the documentary film industry for the past 21 years. She is, um, and STEPS is Social Transformation and Empowerment Project, a nonprofit organization passionate about the power of documentary film to disrupt, shift, and move the world around us. As part of STEPS, she has worked on the award winning STEPS for the Future Why Documentary and Why Poverty documentary projects. She is in charge of acquisitions, and since 2014, she has been curating the catalog for the free-to-view AfriDocs, AfriDocs online documentary platform. Elaine Monet is responsible for program development at STEPS and coordinates the training of STEP facilitators and its network partners. Um, so, Teresa and Elaine, please take it away. Thank you, Gita. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I just, and thanks and hi to everyone. I just want to say a lot of what you just said, Gita, resonates very strongly with our organization. Um, so I'm pleased that we're getting to know each other a little bit better. Um, as you said before, STEPS is, it stands for Social Transformation and Empowerment Projects and is a non-profit organization that was started in 2001. And the first collection of documentary films we produced was called Steps for the Future, which was a response to the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Um, and it was because we felt we, there was a need for positive, inspiring stories. Um, and everything that was available at the time was prescriptive and depressing. We wanted to tell people stories of being infected and affected, but also to give people hope. Um, this collection has grown over the years and the themes have moved away from being specifically HIV and AIDS related to encompassing a number of human rights issues such as child marriage, living with disabilities, gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive rights, LGBTQI issues and issues around sustainable livelihoods. Um, as Gita mentioned, we are passionate about the power of documentary film to start conversations, educate and produce action around social issues. We partner with like-minded organizations to create participatory documentaries about the pertinent issues in our partner organizations' communities. We have developed a training methodology to enable people to effectively use film as a tool for discussion, awareness, and advocacy. Um, the trained facilitators uh, hold facilitated community screenings, in some cases in rural and remote areas using a solar-powered mobile cinema kit to reach audiences as uh, widely across the, the country as possible. Uh, we also produce other film collections for distribution through broadcast television and online through our online documentary platform, Afridox. Um, and through this platform, we're able to respond sort of um, quicker to issues that arise. So, for example, um, as a response to the COVID pandemic, we were able to produce a few short films and have them stream for free online um, on Afridox.net. 
I'm going to hand over to my colleague Elaine, who who deals with uh, the training at Steps and can speak uh, more about that. Elaine. Hello. Good. Um, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening to everyone. And because I, I I normally run trainings and workshops, so it, it helps me a lot when I get a response from people. How is everybody doing? Doing great. <laughs> great, that's wonderful. Thank Lovely. You. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to pick up from where my colleague Teresa left off and just add on a few bits, uh, mostly around the network. So uh, STEPS has partnered with uh, nine civil society uh, organizations in seven countries uh, that are working strongly with young people. We conduct training of facilitator workshops uh, and how to use film as a tool to impact change uh, by means of awareness raising and for advocacy on social and environmental issues, including health. The film uh, resources that the young people use in the facilitated film screenings are all accompanied by a facilitator guide that helps them go through uh, the issues that they're going to be addressing in the specific areas. Um, some of the films are versioned in the local languages because we're working in um, seven countries in southern Africa. Um, the STEPS facilitators have access to these film resources and receive ongoing mentorship from STEPS, which is largely happening via WhatsApp now, uh, especially since uh, the whole COVID thing started. So we've got about nine WhatsApp groups. Well, let me say I've got nine WhatsApp groups on my phone and then the STEPS regional network. So the mentorship and support happens every day and there's inter-country learning of whatever issues. If the other team is doing gender sessions, gender screenings, they post on the regional network to get the more support and, and just to share what they're happening in, in their in individual countries. And um, when I got this from Beer and that, can we speak about how we're using film and health? And I was like, hmm. Health, that's quite a broad topic because when we're doing our facilitated film screenings, I think it don't more and more that health is beyond just being well in the body, you know, but it, it includes, you know, also the mental, social well-being and all of that. And I believe that within the STEPS network, we are contributing towards this ideal uh, via the facilitated film screenings that are conducted by the trained facilitators um, as they go about addressing these social relevant issues. What really stands out and how they're managing to create the impact in their local communities is the working together with key local stakeholders uh, because when they go through the facilitated film screenings, the central part that we focus on is the learning cycle, which we have Christoph um, showing us here. I hope everybody can see it. So in the facilitated film screenings, we collectively watch the film as an audience and the facilitator takes the audience through the discussion, a guided discussion, looking at the issues that the film has raised and linking to the bigger picture of the issues still, and then develop an action plan on how can we as a collective develop an action to address these issues. So for example, one of our key partners in Malawi, there's a high rate of underage um, girl marriages. And to have to get uh, bylaws established, they had to involve key stakeholders. These are traditional authorities, village headmen, and teachers as well. Uh, so this is very important that in our trainings, we really take our trainers through the facilitated film screenings, understanding how to use the facilitator guide and how to invite key stakeholders 
in order to build a strong voice on these advocacy issues that they're addressing in their specific countries. What this has done, it's building a strong network of young people's voices because the few they're being recognized in their communities and the few that they are actually being noted and not just seen as young people. Um, so to us as steps, I think that's really working and more so with the ongoing mentorship that uh, the young people receive and the capacity building. <laughs> Just maybe to further share how we do the facilitated film screenings, I'll ask Christophe to play a clip from the film, I'm Sheriff. We're gonna play it from beginning up to one minute 57. Thanks. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so the clip we saw was from the film I'm Sheriff. Please feel free to watch the film, film to kind of get the whole context of it. Um, I hope some people were able to follow it as it's in subtitles. Um, was everybody able to read the subtitles? Yes. Okay. Yep. So um, just watching that clip, how did it make you feel? Anybody? Curious. Want to hear more. <laughs> okay, thank you. Someone else? How brave that girl was. Mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Thank you. What, what do you think um, made, made her feel brave? Um, I think when you're in the atmosphere and you feel comfortable, you kind of feel like you can just speak un like unapologetically about yourself. So clearly she felt comfortable to just kind of speak and be herself, which is always okay. good. All right, great. Can can you relate to being in her shoes at some point in any time in your life?
Anybody? Most probably the only thing is there needs to be a bit more context. I felt like I, I personally felt like I wanted to know more about her story and how she's linked to Sheriff. Okay. All right. So that was just um, an intro to how we do when we're doing facilitated film screenings. So I just uh, engage us now in some of the few questions that we have in the facilitator guide. Uh, so basically, Sheriff is telling her story as a trans man. And so I really encourage that uh, we create time to watch the full film and just to follow a Sheriff's story. Uh, so in facilitated film screenings, most of the films that we use as steps have been produced uh, through participatory processes. Um, and the protagonists in the film, in most cases, are also trained as facilitators because it carries more weight when the trained facilitator takes their own film in their own community, screens this to their community, as we saw with Sheriff, and engages the people on the subject matter. So with Sheriff, people in her villages used to look at her, but you look like a boy, sometimes you look like a girl, we don't know who you are, that kind of thing. So that film, helped a lot to clear all of that which was going on in the community. So that was just an example to show how we use facilitated film screenings to address different socially relevant issues. Um, so the facilitated film screenings provide a safe environment for community members to have meaningful dialogue leading to collective um, action. Um, and like I said, we center mostly on the learning cycle, which I showed earlier that collectively we develop action plans that are going to help us uh, achieve whatever we are pushing as an agenda. So basically, I think from steps, that's it. Um, yeah, open for questions. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine and Teresa. And I think we're going to have questions at the very end after um, all the presentations. So if people have specific questions right now, please put it in the chat and, and we will get to it at the end. Um, Thank you. I'm now going to, yes. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Oyun Chinik or uh, Oyuna Demchik and Horea Salajan from um, the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation. Oyuna is the founder and CEO. Uh, she is an award-winning TV journalist, content producer, presenter, and media manager. Her career in public media started with the Mongolian National Broadcaster, where she spent over 25 years. Um, during her time there, Oyuna launched and led groundbreaking productions of various genres, including documentaries, drama series, reality shows, TV shows, and even game shows. Oyuna is the first Mongolian journalist to receive the ABU or ABU prize for the best documentary for a film about Mongolian gold miners and she was in, that she produced in 2010. Between 2018 and 2019, she produced and hosted World Stories, one of the most highly rated current affairs programs ever produced in Mongolia. In 2018, the Human Rights Commission recognized World Stories as the only TV program in Mongolia dedicated to human rights defenders. Disappointed about the public broadcasting sector in Mongolia and refusing to play politics with government officials, Oyuna left the Mongolian National Broadcasting in 2019 and founded the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation. The foundation positions itself as an alternative public interest media. The foundation currently acquires high quality educational and topical foreign content and offers it for free distribution to mainstream media. The foreign content is usually accompanied by a locally produced panel discussion where the issues depicted in the films are localized. To date, the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation films have reached national and regional audiences all over Mongolia 
on 15 regional and two top five national TV stations. The goal of the foundation is to produce and commission local content. Um, Oyuna is being joined by Horea Horea Salajan, head of the board of the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation, and they will both uh, stand by uh, for the Q&A se session. So without further ado, Oyuna. We can't hear you, Oyuna. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your warm introduction. And also, first of all, I would like to my deeply grateful to our indigenous family, especially uh, Health Journalist Network, my friends, to give us the opportunity to listen and learning from today's webinar from my friends and all participants. And I don't have only 10 minutes. I just would like to start my pre pre uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Christopher. And uh, my name is, is Ayun Chimik Demchik. You can call just Ayuna. I am the founder and CEO of the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation. Today, my presentation topic is using films to educate to the public on health issues. Okay, then please, Christopher, can you give me next slide? And uh, who we are, I would like to very briefly tell you who we are. We are human defenders. We are content makers based on background in public media. And we are a team of professionals that want to ensure that Mongolia is continuing its path to become a modern democratic society where anyone can make decent living, worry free of political and economic interests. Here I would like to also point it out is briefly to tell you, Mongolia is the uh, before uh, almost 70 years we were under the communist country, especially our neighbor country in the Soviet Union. And after just since 1991, we are starting uh, shifted to democratic society, which means this, our country is still on the way of the to uh, becoming of the democratic society on the way. Okay, and next slide, please, Christopher. And as I told you before, also uh, Gita also uh, briefly told you that about our some part of the mission and the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation contributes to the promotion of public interest, human rights and sustainable development goals by supporting the acquisition, commissioning, production and pre-dissemination of media content in the Mongolia. And okay, next one. And why why we started the Mongolian Public Media Content Foundation. Just would like to teach you this some uh, several reasons. Uh, first of all, I would like to point it out failed public interest media in Mongolia. And uh, in Mongolia, the only one public broadcaster which is named by Mongolian National Broadcaster, which I have been working there almost 25 years. And uh, the Mongolian National Broadcaster is, is still controlled by the government, uh, which means you can understand and see Mongolian National Broadcaster and Mongolian government are same boat now. Therefore, uh, they couldn't fully fulfill the mission to as a public broadcaster to serve to Mongolian public and Mongolian people. Therefore, there is someone should be fill that gap. Therefore, I uh, dedicated all my life to this Mongolian creative industry. And uh, almost 25 years, I just rest of my life, I would like to dedicate also continue my this uh, willing to the serve to public free and independently. That's why I would like to start up and found the, the, the Mongolian Foundation, Public Media Content Foundation. And second very strong reason is 
most of our media, uh, media, private media, commercial media, opaque, and uh, which means business and political interests are dominating the editorial agenda. And next one, in the mostly in the developing country, we are same problem that low quality journalism. And the last one is civil society. Mongolian civil society is struggling to get their messages out, especially mainstream platform. And also, copyright law started being enforced, and mainstream media and local media desperate and hungry for licensed content. Here, I would like to share with you my first case study, um, pandemic 2007. This movie we just uh, broadcasted one national TV and the last year, which just started pandemic in Mongolia. This feature films was uh, for TV hours and of prime time content and entertaining film that we identify to portraying as close as possible a real pandemic. Produced for and premiered on Hallmark TV, which means is Hallmark TV is family oriented TV channel, as you know, and high entertaining value. If you look at from this uh, brochure and the casting pay Donovey and Eric Roberts. And also here would like to I pointed out this content was relatively low price. That was the the first case study and next one Christopher before okay what was the need the need was very little pandemic related content available in the country last year when we started November in the 2020 in the first pandemic case, strict quarantine was started in Ter Mongolia and second thing initially the Mongolian government pandemic response was so effective that for almost 10 months, we did not have any officially reported locally transmitted cases. Oh, oh we can't hear you. On you, you have to unmute. I, oh, oh um, how about now? You're yes, back, you, you know, thank you. Okay. From where should I start? Second point, maybe initially, or should I repeat again? Okay. What was the, it the was need? in the, yeah, it was in the middle. So that's great. Okay. Oh, then know. initial, initially the Mongolian government pandemic response was so effective that for almost 10 months, we did not have any officially reported locally transmitted cases. However, the Mongolian government pandemic responses was successfully same time. There is a rise as many kind of human rights violations was relevant. All this as a cost of the violating human rights needs to raise awareness of the people regarding that during the pandemic time. OK, next slide. Then what we what did we do? First, we found ways to purchase the license, translate, promote and dub the films. And not only uh, translate and dub the films, we also produce a two hours final online discussion with human rights defenders to debate the human rights violation and uh, public health issues. Broadcast the film and the final discussion, one on national TV and uh, 15 regional station. Uh, first, this uh, um, pandemic movie we distributed to regional uh, first station, Dornogov Sum province, when just exactly morning, Mongolian government was started to strict lockdown and the pandemic. And at the same time, we uh, very immediately we managed our content to distribute the first or first local TV stations, which is named Dornogov TV, which means is we uh, for 
the Mongolian national broadcaster, other TV media didn't cover any content related with pandemic, the Mongolian media public foundation was started very immediately uh, distributed this content. And uh, also we repackage in social media clips, promote the final discussion. Okay, next slide. The, what was the achievement? What is the result from there? There are several results, but I will just put here first four of them. Definitely it's fill the gap in content related to human rights violation during the pandemic in mainstream media and social media. TV share on national TV for the two nights between 9 to 50%. Provide lifeline license at alternative which means non-government ordered high quality thematic content to regional TV stations. Provide a mainstream media platform to human rights defenders for free. And uh, our foundation's one format is business model is we not only broadcasted that high quality, independent, international compelling story. After this uh, content, we always add value augmented you know discussion this is uh, some kind of very different kind of approach and model in mongolia first i wish to be initiated our prom foundation okay next slides can you please provide and uh, here you can see collective movie this is the one of the very uh, first time in Mong in the uh, first time we brought in mongolia and the multiple awards winner and Oscar 2021 nominated documentary. Sorry, he wrote 2020. And the film depicts endemic corruption in the public health system of a first communist country. The situation is very similar to Mongolia. And uh, next slide. What was the need? The need was Mongolian authorities attempted to harden the punishment for libel offenses, including for journalists. No media covering issues in the public health system, all of collapsing, low quality and corrupt. And what did we do? And again, next slide, Christopher. And first, same like previously, founders to purchase the license and translate, promote and dub the films and produce an interview with the protagonist and main character of the film, Catalin Tolantan, a Romanian investigative journalist. And uh, also we made broadcast the film two times. First is uh, the Mongolian top of uh, number one TV is National Mongol HD TV and in second our broadcast was through the Mongolian National Broadcaster. And also we distributed 15 regional stations. Each regional, each stations rebroadcast this movie is three to five times, which means is how the demand was there in the countryside audiences. And also same repackaging social media clips promote the final discussion. And uh, after this collective movie, we really amazing results received, received because we broadcast this uh, exactly same like during the pandemic was very much a great problem and so many issues arise. And second broadcast was through the Mongolian National Broadcaster exactly morning of the uh, Oscar 2020. That was the very uh, prime time on the platform through the Mongolian National Broadcaster. And uh, the results here you can see and steer the online conversation in regards to the Mongolian health system, raise the awareness to solutions to improving the public health system, premiere the film and the interview on two national TV stations, including Mongolian National Broadcaster. Pro provide lifeline licenses and alternative thematic content to regional TV stations. And after that, just two days when we 
broadcast this movie and the government resigns after unseen protest is triggered by a news story that shows the mistreatment by health workers of a mother and her newborn baby infected with COVID-19. Also, after this, the, we had a very big wireless on the social media platform and also two, three news uh, reporters and investigation journalists there made very big investigative story in the Mongolia that time, which means it's definitely we hope that it's inspired and, you know, educated some freelancers and some news journalists. And uh, we can end off this weekend. If you have some questions and clarification, please welcome. And more information if you would like to see and please visit to our foundation website. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oyuna. Um, so we are running a little behind. Uh, yeah. we, we're going to hear from Black Girls Films now, and we will stay a little a little after the hour for a Q&A. Um, so a degree in education at the University of Chicago. When she heard the verdict, her heart broke as she thought of her nine-month-old son and came to the realization that America could not keep her son safe. That day she took a stand with the Say Her Name campaign after the murder of another 22-year-old black woman, Rakia Boyd. Yane is turning to film to create authentic narratives that inspire holistic change and justice for all black people. Um, she's being joined by Sherelle Swain, a filmmaker and creative strategist working at the intersection of social impact, racial justice, and activism. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to let Yane and Sherelle take the stage and share their work at Black Girls Film. Thank you so much, Gita. Um, I just want to say your voice saying my bio just sounded very, I was like, I need to get that recorded. It just sounded so beautiful. <laughs> um, so we are, Sherelle and I are representing two thirds of what has anchored our production team at Black Girls Film. It's been a very beautiful alignment of our own collective journeys and also this really beautiful opportunity to have an offering of a conversation that's been completely urgent um, since Black folks have been in America and really in this moment making a shift of the paradigm from the things that ail us to the things that actually support us and allow us to thrive. Um, and so we can just, in the interest of time, we can just go through the slides and I'll try as best I can to walk us through. Okay, am I able to go through to the next one? You can move forward. Next slide. Next slide. Um, next slide. Next slide, please, Krista. Next, next slide. slide, please, Krista. Next slide. Next one. Next slide.
And next slide. So as that's coming up, um, the narrative that we spoke to um, in, in this presentation is really the core of what we see as our mission and our vision for the Work With Black Girls film. Um, we've been working on this um, for about two years now and it's anchored in our own experience, but also deeply anchored in um, the archival work and research that we've done on Black women and girls since we've been here in, in, Amer in the American context, and then also in deep qualitative and quantitative research as it relates to mental health, um, inclusive of economic health, um, mental, emotional, um, spiritual, and uh, what is it, social health as well. And so with all those factors and variables, we've talked to quite a few Black women and girls, and we'll speak to that in a little bit. And if we can go to the slide after Let Black Girls Leads Away, I believe that that would be slide um, eight. So Christoph, would you please be able to move to slide eight? Um, a little, one more, please. Forward to the number eight slide, please. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so when we look here at the story specifically, the story really follows the journey of a young black millennial um, fashion model named Ebony Davis, who came into activism um, really by virtue and in the same way that many of us as black girls in America come into social change and social movement, which is really by necessity. And that's really why we chose Ebony as our main character, because her experience is such that she is already on her own very personal um, journey of trying to rise from financial instability, um, coming from a family that deals with poverty, substance abuse, different compounded traumas that is not un, um, dissimilar to many of the experiences of Black wo uh, women and girls in America. And then it's thrust into this larger existential question of how, as someone who is in deeply in the experience of being Black in America, able to find what success means and what it looks like. And so this is why we chose Ebony to be our main character. And her story is just a really beautiful representation of someone who decides that her experience is so deeply valuable that not only is she gonna to advocate to live her truest and most authentic version of herself, but she also is inspired to figure out how she can use her platform to become a leader, a voice, and a beacon for other Black women and girls. And so through her, we track this journey of wellness and health, and we discover so many beautiful things about how Black women and girls are actually able to thrive and sustain in America. And a lot of that has been connection to um, spaces that are affirming and anchored by other Black women and girls. That is being able to connect to something beyond the American context, um, which we actually have a, a, a major portion of the film production taking us to Ghana, where Ebony is um, taking scholars from her organization daughter on birthright trips to actually participate in some rites of passage ceremonies and activities in Ghana, um, upcoming actually in a few weeks in July. And then also being able to be supported um, materially and also um, and also in terms of uh, more educational 
wise and to what other possi possibilities are actually available and what other lives could Black women and girls have if they were supported and not hunted or treated as invisible or hyper-visible or hyper-sexualized or um, made to be seen as adults, as young children or harassed, right? And all the numerous of et cetera and et cetera that we see in America. Um, and so that is really the beauty of just choosing this story and moving with it in the way that we have. Um, and my bio already really speaks to a lot of my why. So I'm really excited to have Sherelle Swain, who has been um, a major confidant and mover and producer of this project to speak to um, the work that we've done um, to date to really move this forward. As we see this as more of a movement for healing um, in addition to this contribution to film. And we could probably go to um, the next slide, Christoph, please. Um, and, and moving beyond that as well to the next one, sorry. Yep, and just one more slide um, to slide 11. And I'll just keep it brief because I know that we are running short. Thank you, Christoph, that's perfect on time. Um, my name is Sherelle Swain. I am a producer for Black Girls Film. Um, as John A. explained, um, this project is much more than a film, but also a social impact campaign that we're creating um, as Black women, as Black filmmakers, um, focusing on highlighting the stories of other Black girls and women. We're just incredibly honored um, to build a, a team um, and a Black female-led crew as well as a social impact campaign that does build the curiosity, does highlight the self-determination and does allow platforms for black girls and black women to express themselves. One of the inspirations for me um, on this project as we have focused on centering black girls and black women as expertise is this data point. Um, we learned um, through Catalyst, um, an educational, think tank here and research institution and US-based that Black women accredit other Black women for their success in their careers and in financial wealth and general progress more than any other demographic or ethnicity. And understanding that data point and the support that Black women provide one another um, we really do look at it as such a special opportunity to create that experience for other Black women and girls to be supported and to see themselves not only through this film, but through the activations that we are designing by way of our wellness tour, which we have called Black Girls Heal. Um, through Black Girls Heal, we are activating conversations that are intergenerational um, that allow space to uncover what is behind the black girl magic that we often so hard, so often hear about. And so um, we have already activated that for Women's History Month and we're going to continue to offer programming workshops and sessions to um, schools, nonprofit organizations and other partners in Chicago, South Carolina, Washington DC and Los Angeles in order to continue sparking curiosity and love for Black girls in their communities. And so that's a little bit about the project. Um, one other point that I will end on is um, as documentarians and as writers, we really saw a need to ensure that Black girls' stories are told in a way that's holistic and nuanced as we began to gather data and research, uh, what we saw over and over are our health statistics that highlight Black women as in the United States and across the world with the highest mortality rates um, of other, any other ethnicity um, or demographic. Uh, we saw overwhelming suicide rate attempts of Black girls in the United States. And just in December, Black women in the United States lost more jobs than any other demographic. And while those data and statistics are important, we thought it 
was important to shape a qualitative narrative that was more similar to the joy, resiliency, and divinity that we heard from the Black girls in the um, more than 200 hours of interviews and conversations that we've hosted. So that's what we'll be able to highlight through this story. And um, we just are really thankful to Internews for being an early partner of us in this work. And uh, we're excited to continue building with you all. So thank you for um, the opportunity to share more about Black Girls Film. Thank you. Um, th thank you so much. Uh, that is so inspiring. I love the intergenerational, spiritual, solution-driven um, vision you guys have. And all of you, I was just thinking of what STEPS does um, and comparing it to what you're doing in Chicago and how many um, connections there are. So, um, well, I think we have gone over time and uh, maybe what we can do is if folks have questions, uh, they can put it in our Teams chat and maybe we can take that offline. Uh, I, I love hearing from three such different organizations across the globe. Um, you're doing different work in different regions and you all really have the same goal of building awareness, building dialogue and changing the story for the future. Um, so I, I, I just applaud everybody's amazing work and I'm so glad that we're all in the internews family together. And, um, and uh, I think we should all just stay in touch as we continue our good work. So I just wanna thank everybody for presenting and for joining us. Please do email any questions or teams any questions and, and we will be sure to get back to you. Thank you so much and have a great, great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye, -bye. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.